First ones we put online? Yeah, for the audio when the space started three years ago, it was like pretty much every one. Freddie was really on top of that. Yeah, it was so on top. Um, and then that trickled out. I'm not going to try to be religious about it, especially because I'm not going to be in house, but like hopefully one of each of the intros every other month or so that kind of keeps up with uh, you know, changing climate around here. There's lots of new faces in all this space. But I'm also lazy as I am just gonna put it on there. <laughs> Let it do its job. Thank you everybody. Thanks for coming everybody. I'm gonna wait a few more minutes. If you need the bathroom, it is straight back through this hallway. There's water back there too. And we uh, have beer for a very suggested donation of three dollars. So you can talk to me. Taylor will be presenting, so probably don't ask him to buy beer. But uh, myself, yes, Krishna, Daniel, pretty much anyone around the corner of this room. <laughs> and as Taylor said, he's getting started in a couple minutes.
Space that's split between a bunch of members who um, kind of all started out in the beginning to be a place to do the, just this, have meetings about Bitcoin, um, because there was a few people um, in Vancouver three years ago now, just over three years ago, um, that were very excited about what this technology is and what it's going to do and how it's going to change the world, and they just thought we want to talk about it and got a space. Um, and we kind of run it as a cooperative, essentially. It's a bunch of members that share the space, share access, share taking care of it, and nobody's uh, making any money off of it. It's a total fly, fly hierarchy. And we kind of manage that system using Bitcoin. Our savings for the space is in a multi-sig Bitcoin wallet that's between um, kind of the main founders or the main members who are in the space. We kind of keep it together. Um, so, so, yeah, it's really we working. We a new one on Friday, actually, with the new members, because we had been going off the same one for three years, so this is an exciting decentralizing moment for, uh, yeah, for so the space as well. We're, we're putting on more signatories so that there's more freedom and less choke points in, like, getting people paid back for expenses and stuff. It's, uh, he built the accounting system with Manuel, who's in the back room. Praise. It's really cool stuff. Um... Yeah, so I guess maybe start with my story or why I'm so interested in Bitcoin. I found out about it um, about three years ago as well. I was working as an accountant at the time, or on the way to becoming an accountant. Um, and I quickly got very excited about um, what this technology is and how I think it's going to change the world. And I started to learn to code. And now I came to Vancouver and started working as a dev and um, got really involved with this place. And I've been doing these intro to Bitcoin meetings for um, about two years now. So, Woo. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, um, so I guess the 
thing that you need to understand about Bitcoin is this thing is working in the wild right now. This isn't a theoretical thing. This is a thing that's out there. It's working. People are moving money back and forth to each other um, right now. And all of it's public. So this is um, a visualization of the transactions that are currently right now being broadcast to the Bitcoin network. Um, the blue balls are between 100 and 1,000 Bitcoin, which means that's a lot of money moving. Um, and it's constant and it's always happening all the time. There's about 2,000 Bitcoin transactions that happen every 10 minutes. Um, and although all the information is public about where these transactions are moving to, the pseudonyms or who those transactions are going between are just strings of information. So um, when you look at an address of one of these transactions, so this is one of the most recent blocks created, and these are some of the transactions in this block. Um, so we can see the miner who mined this block um, got 13 and a half Bitcoin, so that's 12 and a half Bitcoin worth of new Bitcoin, newly minted Bitcoin, um, and just over another Bitcoin worth of fees that were paid by the transactions that were included in this block. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later. Um, but this is an example of the information that is public on the Bitcoin network. So these are just random strings. Um, and when you make a Bitcoin wallet, it makes for you um, an infinite number of random strings that you can use to receive money. So there's no, there's no scarcity in these um, numbers at all. When you have a, it's free to create a Bitcoin wallet. You can have as many Bitcoin wallets as you want. Um, and you can have as many addresses as you want. They're um, essentially infinite. There's so many that you could use all the energy in the sun trying to make more addresses and you wouldn't make uh, enough to, you wouldn't make all of them. Um, so what exactly is Bitcoin and how did it get started? Um, so it's eight years ago now, maybe a little more. Um, there was this paper published to um, uh, Linux or a cryptography um, mailing list. This place where um, academics who do um, cryptography um, put their work up to get peer review and to say, um, this, is, this is a new thing, I think it's going to work, this is how it works, um, please criticize, please where are the holes. Um, so a random person, or not a random person, but an anonymous person who called himself Satoshi Nakamoto um, pointed, uh, posted this um, to that mailing list. And it explains the fundamental building blocks of how Bitcoin works and how this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer money system um, actually functions um, in a way that prior to this paper, um, no one had thought of how to do a system like this. Like we, we've had digital signatures forever. We've had hashing systems forever. We've had all the pieces in this puzzle um, for a long time. They're just like very fundamental computer science things. But until this paper, they hadn't been put together in this way that creates this um, digital money system, this decentralized digital money system. Um, okay. So how does it work? Um, the fundamental thing, or the most important thing to understand about um, how Bitcoin works, is there's this open competition among um, people who want to create more Bitcoin, um, called Bitcoin miners. And in that competition, they need to use um, computer cycles to uh, compute hash functions. And um, the more people attempting to create Bitcoin, the harder it becomes to create Bitcoin. So there's this um, feedback cycle that always ensures that um, on average over a two week period, there will be a Bitcoin block every 10 minutes. And it's just kind of baked into the system, this um, feedback loop. If blocks are being created too quickly, then it becomes harder to make blocks. If blocks aren't being created fast enough, it becomes easier to make blocks. Or so it can require more energy or require less energy, depending on the last um, two weeks worth of blocks. Um, and that system of using energy to verify these blocks, or putting this energy and this provable work into the system, um, makes forging the system extremely hard. The only way you can forge um, or create um, uh, kind of a fake Bitcoin block to trick somebody into thinking they have money um, is if you 
outcompete the entire system of Bitcoin miners. So only in the event that you have more than 51% of the systems or the, the hardware that uses energy to try and create Bitcoin blocks can you actually effectively attack the network. And those, um, those devices that you would use to attack the network are the exact same device that you would use to participate in the network to make money off of it. So it's kind of this really nice game theory setup where um, all the actors are pushed to the positive corner to just kind of let this system operate and never, like, if, if a block is created, um, it is very unlikely that it's going to be reversed ever. So if you receive Bitcoin and you see it in a block, you see the transaction paying you Bitcoin it has been mined in one of these um, Bitcoin blocks, you can have a very strong um, certainty that it will never be reversed, that you, you have that money and it's now yours. So um, there's, of course that cuts both ways. If you send Bitcoin to somebody and then decide that that was a mistake or he's a scammer or whatever, um, too bad for you, essentially. There's no, um, it's a system of bare assets, it's a system of personal responsibility. Um, no one, not even the most powerful state actors, no, no one has the power to um, turn back the time of Bitcoin. Um, so it's this very powerful thing, I think. Um, any questions on that? Um, is the mining process then different for, like, for different digital currencies? Uh, um, the vast majority of other cryptocurrencies um, are working in the same way that Bitcoin yeah. works in that they are uh, based on proof of work. Um, some of them have brought in more like social constructs about they're, they're trying to also um, pay developers or they're trying to also, um, uh, some, there's some altcoins that uh, have decided that they don't need this proof of work innovation of that at all, they can just do it with proof of stake. Um, I don't think that has the same amount of same strength of the promise that it won't be reversed and it can't be coerced as proof of work does. Um, but the vast majority of them are some version of this. Like the, the hashing function is a little different, or the blocks happen a little bit quicker, or some selling feature that they they say this is going to be better in Bitcoin because of X Y Z. Buy this instead. Um, essentially, send us your Bitcoin. I'm very skeptical of all of the altcoin projects. I think the vast majority of them um, are just ways to yeah, take the coin from, from people that want to <laughs> make more money. <laughs> Sounds like a rabbit hole. Um, yeah, it is. Um, hey, yeah, any other questions? You said proof of work <clears throat> was proof of stake? Yeah, proof of stake. So the proof of stake systems rely on essentially voting and you have as many votes as you're holding currency, so you like lock up your currency in these systems. Um, I think there's a lot of incentive problems with that way of doing it, but I think we're going to see it um, go into the wild with Ethereum soon, so we'll get a, we'll see what happens. Is Ethereum a proof of state? Uh, Ethereum is proof of work now, <coughs> um, but they've always had it kind of in their plan um, to move to proof of state, and I believe that day is coming soon. See what happens. Um, yeah, proof of stake is very alluring because there is a lot of energy burnt in Bitcoin. And what the heck is it getting us? Like, you can kind of see like it could power, I, I don't know how many apartment buildings, how many houses, a lot. It's a significant amount of energy being used. Um, but we get from it this decentralized, very secure money system. And I think that's worth it. And the miners are um, paid in Bitcoin, so, and they have this real expensive electricity. So um, nobody really gets Bitcoin for free anymore. They, um, even the miners have to uh, put in a lot of expense in order to create the Bitcoin that they're creating. Um, okay, yeah, so there was this paper that kind of explained that proof of work dynamic and explain how um, the transactions work. Um, so Bitcoin transactions uh, are quite simple on the onset. Most people only use Bitcoin to just transfer money from one person to the other simply. Um, but the Bitcoin transactions actually work um, with scripts. And those scripts allow you to do um, some pretty interesting things. Um, for 
one example that's pretty simple is the multi-sig um, contract that um, the central is um, the central's Bitcoin is held in a script that says um, at least two of these three people must sign this um, in order for it to be a valid thing. Um, and that you can do more scripting on top of that. You can um, create a secret piece of information, and they, the person you're sending Bitcoin to, can only um, spend that Bitcoin if you've also given them the secret. So there's this way to like um, bind contracts or bind a scrope. Sorry, Justin. Um, yeah. So I guess the takeaway from that is that. Um, even though um, th there's been a lot of projects aren't not Bitcoin saying they're going to provide these smart contract platforms, um, but Bitcoin is not completely dumb itself. Bitcoin has a scripting language in it, and it's really locked down. It's really simple, um, and it I think is necessarily simple because um, the more um, complex it is, the more attack surface there is. Um, and attack surface in a money system can cost people money, and it's very dangerous. So. Um, the scripting system in Bitcoin is simple, um, and it's kind of proven itself as it's protected $30 billion worth of value for a foreseeable amount of time. Like, uh, I think there's not major problems in the Bitcoin scripting language as, as it's operating today. Um, okay, so um, the paper came out, and a few months later, um, the same alias, um, released some C++ code that um, implemented what Bitcoin is. Um, it, it implemented uh, um, the mining algorithm and how the transactions work and it implemented everything um, and he started it off. And it, at the beginning it was just him mining blocks on his own computer. And then there was a few other like very crypto nerds that came in and started mining as well because um, as it's an open system there's no way to prevent other people from joining. So it just kind of started to grow organically, mostly in the very technical community of people uh, who are like, this is interesting, like, this is probably broken, like, I'm going to go try and break this. Um, and over time, I think a lot of very smart cryptographers found out they couldn't really break it. And then they helped make it better. Um, and there's now a GitHub. So we can see this thing is constantly active. There's over 15,000 changes that have been made on this project from 470 different people. And it's just kind of um, really spiraled. Like this is some of the most battle-hardened, well-tested software that's ever been written. I think that's fair to say. Um, and it's all backwards compatible. It's all compatible with the original Satoshi code that was um, originally written. Um, any questions about that? What is that? What are you talking about? What am I talking about? <laughs> so this, this is the code um, of the Bitcoin client. Um, so Bitcoin nodes um, run this software, and that software um, downloads the entire history of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, it goes through every single block and every single transaction and validates that those blocks and transactions have followed the rules of what Bitcoin is. Um, and those rules are um, the scarcity of Bitcoin itself. There's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be created. Um, at this point, we've mined about 15 million worth of the Bitcoin, and I think a large portion of those have been lost because people didn't know what they were messing with, and it's pretty easy to lose your Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it validates the kind of the rules of mining and the difficulty adjustments and the things that um, make Bitcoin what it is. Uh, so you can run this software, it's all open source, it's constantly being worked on. Um, and yeah, it, it, just on an old laptop, um, you can have this fully validating thing that validates all the transactions that happen in Bitcoin uh, and kind of relays around the transactions that um, have just happened. Um, and if you have a phone wallet, um, you'll be going out to and connecting to a bunch of these nodes and then like comparing the information between them and seeing um, who's telling you the truth. So um, if I spend five years researching C++, I could go there and help make the Bitcoin ecosystem better, stronger and better? Yeah. The gold right there, okay. 
So what happens when it reaches 21 million coin? Um, so that is a long way away. Um, but the system will have to then become sustainable on the fees that are being charged to the people making transactions. Um, yeah, so the, the rules that was written in the software from the beginning is that every 10 minutes at the start, um, 50 Bitcoin were being created um, with each block that was made. Um, and then um, a certain amount of time passed and it cut that in half. So 25 Bitcoin was being made every 10 minutes. Um, and then it cut in half again, and this is the current period we're in right now. Um, it's 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes. Um, and I think in maybe a year from now or two years, not quite sure, um, it will then go to six and a quarter, and then go to three and a 15th or whatever. Um, so that's how the, the 21 million is just the limit of that um, decreasing function. Um, but what's gonna happen then? Who knows? Like, what will the value of Bitcoin be in 100 years? Um, who knows? Maybe nobody will be mining it then. It's hard to say the future. Um, any other questions? Okay, cool. So, at the beginning, it was mostly just um, developers and crypto people in the Bitcoin space. Um, but as the idea of what this thing is spread, um, I think. It's fair to say that at the beginning there was a lot of kind of libertarian-minded people or freedom, Austrian economist type people that started getting into the space. Um, and they find Bitcoin interesting um, because it's freedom from state money. It is a money that is a bearer asset that if you have Bitcoin and you're having, if you have the keys, there is no one who can confiscate that from you. You can just memorize 12 words in your head and you can have that Bitcoin, um, you can recover it wherever you are. Um, from any random computer. So it's this kind of very liberating thing um, that a lot of people started to get excited about. Um, and then the dark net market started to happen. So you've probably heard of Silk Road. Anybody hasn't heard of Silk Road? Okay. Um, so the Silk Road was the very first um, dark web um, market. So the dark web is a place where you can go on the internet um, using a browser called Tor that um, anonymizes everyone's access to and sourcing um, hosting of information. So um, when you go to these sites on the dark web, you go to them anonymously. Um, and Silk Road was the first site of this nature that accepted Bitcoin or used Bitcoin as kind of the transaction between um, vendors and consumers. And, and Silk Road got quite big and um, it got on the radar of um, senators. There were senators in the US calling like, you must shut this thing down, uh, make it go away. At, at its height, there was thousands of orders happening every day and people were just mailing drugs through the US postal system so it was making the authorities look uh, pretty dumb. Um, and I think that's how a lot of people um, really came into Bitcoin or started to find it useful because it allowed them to um, access uh, basically anything you want. You could find um, all sorts of drugs and crazy things on these dark net markets. Um, and there was, yeah, there was very little control and there was very, um, it was very difficult for the authorities to find this thing. Um, the Silk Road was eventually shut down um, and the the founder of it, or the person who um, was accused of being the person who run and orchestrated the whole thing, named Ross Ulbrich, got sentenced to two life sentences in prison and will be in jail for the rest of his life. And it's quite a sad story. I suggest you all watch the documentary on it. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, can, I see myself in Ross for sure. It's um, pretty crazy that he's just got completely, um, like the rest of his life taken away. Um, okay, any questions about that kind of first wave of Bitcoin adoption? Okay, was there, um, as like the Silk Road was moving more and more and using more Bitcoin, did that drive up the price of Bitcoin mm -hmm. about that time? Or Definitely, kind of so the price, the price before then, like it's hard to say, I, got, I do have a price yeah. chart here. So the Silk Road days were way back here. 
uh, it's hardly even on the chart uh, this morning. <laughs> um, but yes, I think it's fair to say that um, the Silk Road helped bootstrap to some sort of value. Uh, and Bitcoin was trading for pennies back then, maybe it reached a dollar. It at one point went up to $30 and then crashed all the way to less than a dollar. So for the people who've been around to Bitcoin for a long time, they've kind of seen this bubble and pop and bubble and pop repeat. Um, are we in a bubble now? Maybe, who knows. Um, but yeah, I think the, um, the value of Bitcoin comes from people trading it, people using it, so I think that it's fair to say that all of the activity on the dark net markets um, was good for Bitcoin, but maybe bad for its perception. Talk about the, uh, the pizza purchase. Um, yeah, the first, so well before Silk Road, um, the first recorded Bitcoin transaction between um, two people was a guy on the internet saying, um, I really want a pizza or two pizzas, I have 10,000 Bitcoin, will anybody um, <laughs> will anybody buy me some pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin? Um, and yeah, someone took him up on it, or the trade happened. And $24. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's worth 100 million. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but who knows? That, that guy who received that Bitcoin, maybe when it got to worth a dollar each, he's like, yes, and sold it. Or maybe it got to $100 and he sold it. You have to be. Um, a pretty strong holder to hold on through all this madness. Yeah. What's been happening since April that the prices spiked so much? Um, yeah. News-wise, it's hard to say. Nothing too important. Uh, there was actually a rumor that China was going to ban all the mining and also the exchanges. So uh, there were a lot of uncertainty in the market. So that's what caused a lot of the downturn, and now it's at a stable, stable level where people are gaining confidence that China won't ban mining or exchanges anymore. So that's why markets like it's been stable for like a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, well, she's talking from April. So yeah. <laughs> why, why did that happen? Um, Is it yeah, because of the ICOs. Like, I do feel like there's a lot of money coming into Bitcoin. Uh, that's just kind of routing through. There's, um, there's kind of this ecosystem happening of um, businesses or ideas raising money for themselves through the Ethereum platform. Um, and there have been many ICOs that have raised um, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, worth of this Ethereum cryptocurrency. Um, and all of that value comes into the system through Bitcoin. I already think the vast majority of it. Um, so. Don't forget that around April, uh, there was the talk with the ETF, and I think that brought in a lot of, um, um, because that's when I got in, and so I kind of remember it. It was not too bad before, and after it kind of got crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, as price speculation, I have no idea. I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know. I think um, there's kind of more and more people finding out about Bitcoin, um, and Bitcoin is progressively getting better and better and more and more useful. So I think there's two kind of things happening that make me think over the long term, this is a good uh, thing to be in. But in the short term, like if you go back to a thousand, and I would still say Bitcoin's great. But if you just bought now, you may not agree. <laughs> One thing that's really cool, and it's not predictive of this happening again, but I found it really cool that throughout its history, it's always had like panic cycles of every, oh, we're freaking out, every, people are selling, etc. The most recent scandal upon its name, if you will, was a uh, dude from JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, like basically said very publicly, oh, it will, you know, like that it's illegit, cryptocurrencies are illegitimate. And like they, you know, like the government would shut that shit down if it got big enough. Now, it, we did have a dip, but we also had a really quick recovery from it. In the same, like, if it's usually people will immediately be like, you know what, I'm out with this, or they have been up until this year, it seems, and there was a lot more holding, it seemed, in this one, ultimately. And um, they showed that JP Morgan continued to trade for their clients and pick up cryptocurrency. <laughs> and people have put forth, uh, a couple of people filed reports and shit where they were like, um, can we penalize this person? Because 
it's pretty, I think, I feel like it's pretty well acknowledged that uh, it was a purposeful market manipulation of like, oh, let's get some people to panic, the price um, will drop by a thousand. Yeah, so, and, and, that, and that's a good point. Like, yeah. when the SEC rejected the Bitcoin ETF, the main salient point was uh, Bitcoin markets are too small, market manipulation is really possible. Uh, and they're very right about that. Bitcoin is very small, there are a lot of people in the world that have a a lot of money, um, and these markets can go a lot one way or the other just because big players uh, want to trade against it. Um, so I think, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a wild west at this point. It's very difficult to prove. There are a lot of Bitcoin exchanges that you can trade on anonymously, um, or ways to get Bitcoin outside of the system. So it's, uh, yeah, I think we ex should expect to see a lot of market manipulation, a lot of Banker crap affecting Bitcoin um, for the foreseeable future. So a lot of people look at Bitcoin at, at the price. Like, is there a, a smarter way of looking at Bitcoin and explaining to people like, don't just look at the price. Actually, look at the technology behind it. Like, is there an easy way of? <laughs> um, well, one way is the transaction volume. So the transaction volume has been um, steadily increasing to the point of actually filling up Bitcoin blocks. Bit about in a bit. Um, so I think the transactions per day is a good chart to look at. It just shows this. Um, That's two years. That's two years. Um, the other thing I like to look at is here. So these are charts of the volume traded on. Um, the Bitcoin exchanges that are not um, registered value, but this is the local Bitcoins or Paxful where you can just um, essentially Craigslist buying Bitcoin and selling Bitcoin. Um, and we can see that the values on these things has just been steadily increasing. So more and more people are um, just out on the street buying Bitcoin from someone who has Bitcoin. Uh, I think that's a very strong indicator that uh, people are finding a use for this and that people are actually using it. Uh, there's another really strong indicator, like uh, uh, some people don't really buy into it, but Coinbase has just been exploding with new signups. True. Sure. So right. what, what so order of signups per day is it at now? Uh, well, there was a Reddit post like last week, and it was a hundred thousand were done within a forty-eight hour period, and uh, before that, like about a month or two months ago, it was like forty thousand a day or something. It, it's just it's going crazy. Yeah, so Coinbase is one of the major brokers of Bitcoin in the United States uh, where you can sign up for this and buy Bitcoin, I believe, with a credit card. Is that possible on Coinbase? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it, they point out in the Reddit, just so we can all picture it, we looked it up, that's a football stadium full of people within 48 hours. Signing up on one exchange. Not like a CFL stadium, like we're all used to. We're talking about an NFL stadium. <laughs> <laughs> it's just getting Super real. Cool it's getting real. Um, yeah, and, and that's an indicator that um, who knows how what it really means. Who knows how much Bitcoin those people are actually going to buy. Um, who knows if those are real people. Um, yeah. Look at like how much money has been bought in the ecosystem in a 24-hour period. That's yeah, um, so another metric that um, is interesting to watch is how much volume is being traded on the Bitcoin exchanges every day, um, like the major um, registered ones. Um, so this is a list of the value that's being traded in Bitcoin. So there's 56,000 um, Bitcoin traded in US dollars um, today, um, and 12,000 worth of euros, and then you can go down the list and you can kind of see a comparison of um, this is the U.S. cross price, and this is the premium, or um, opposite of the premium that they're trading at. Um, so, yeah, I think there are a lot of metrics that show that um, this ecosystem is really growing um, at an exponential rate. Um, so it's a very exciting place to be. What is cross price? Um, cross price means, um, so they're trading a certain amount um, in euros, um, for a price in euros, but that price equivalent in US dollars is this. So we see the price in US dollars for US dollars is 48.15, 
and the price in euros is 47.85, uh, which means there's a small, um, slightly less than the U.S. price. Um, and these markets, it's been interesting watching how much they've tightened up. Like when at the beginning, um, the, the difference between the price of Bitcoin in the UK versus Canada versus the US was quite wide and there was all this opportunity for people to buy Bitcoin here and sell it here and make money off that. But those gaps have really narrowed. Um, and only, um, only Brazil, actually, is, Brazil's one of the places where there's a huge premium and it's consistent, 9% like overvalue. Uh, yeah, but that means a lot of Bitcoins going to Brazil. Does it show like what country buys the most Bitcoin? Um, it shows what country trades the most Bitcoin. The U.S. dollar is the primary trading currency, followed by the euro. Yeah, it's actually in order. Bit right on that. I was talking to someone online actually yesterday about um, there is a huge uprise in setting up uh, blockchain uh, developer education programs in Brazil and Chile. Like they're both both the countries are just like like they're trying to get some like accredited style, not like here's our hackathon thing and you'll learn or whatever. Like that like to get a one year boot camp for. Because one of the important things about getting experienced people is not just for them to build projects, but for them to test the code. It's just like open source software itself. Like as a community with this these trustless quote unquote protocol calls, we're really trusting that we have skilled eyes vetting all the code. That's important, you know, always always read your code or try to find compatriots who come around here, there's a lot of depth here, who can uh, you know, translate your contracts. Because they're literal contracts when you're buying into ICOs or things like that, or you're literally signing money away. So Um, okay, any questions before I keep going? Um, okay, so I've kind of talked about the mining and how it works, how you send transactions between each other. Uh, maybe I should talk a little bit about um, actually using Bitcoin. Um, so to use Bitcoin, you need to um, find Bitcoin wallet software. Um, and there are a lot of choices for Bitcoin wallet software, um, ranging from wallets on your phone, um, to wallets on your computer, to actual um, hardware wallets that their only purpose is to sign Bitcoin transactions. Um, and there are also such things as paper wallets. Um, all of these choices have one thing in common. Their only thing that they're doing is saving private keys. And those private keys allow you to spend some Bitcoin that's actually on the network, just pointing to the public key that is in your control. So you have these private key wallets that, um, yeah, they'll let you spend any Bitcoin that's associated with those private keys. Um, I'd recommend on your phone, um, the one we've been using as our multi-sig here is called Copay. Um, it's um, quite good. Um, and it's on Android and iPhone. Um, there's another one called Mycelium on Android and iPhone. Um, that's really great. There's another wallet um, that's just called Bitcoin Wallet. Um, that's the one I've been using because it's the only choice on BlackBerry. Uh, <laughs> but it works great. Haven't had a problem. Um, Copay. Copay. Uh, Mycelium. Um, and the place to that I really kind of offset my um, um, Bitcoin.org has been running since the very beginning, and it has all sorts of really good resources. Uh, that explain what Bitcoin is, how it's used, um, and all the information about um, wallets and things like that. So we can see here, if we're looking at mobile wallets, um, the things Dave said, these ones are great, and I think if they're here, you can, um, you can count on it working. The thing, the thing I like about Mycelium is um, Every month, it asks you to re put in the, uh, the, the private key because how many people are like, oh, where did that piece of paper go over? If they can't remember it, or you know, so it helps you like put that up, put those numbers back or those words back in. Okay, um, so that's a good point. Um, the vast majority of these wallets work with um, a seed, so in order to 
um, be assured that even if your phone breaks, you still have your Bitcoin. You write down um, 12 words, um, and those words are randomly generated in a way that's very random, very strong. Um, and from those words, you can generate all the private keys in the wallet that um, you ever use. It, it actually generates um, a list of private keys one after the other, and um, that means uh, your wallet can have any number of addresses, an infinite number of addresses. So um, this, but this, it's sorry, this doesn't split it into software and hardware wallets, though, right? Um, yeah, it does. Does it? Um, yeah, if I click here. Oh, right there. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I, I've actually just had the opportunity to get a Trezor, um, and it's pretty cool. And definitely um, some peace of mind that I can look at my Bitcoin without um, worrying about that being a risk, uh, which kind of was true when I was just doing it with the words in my brain. Um, yeah, so the, the key is... Um, all of your Bitcoin can be backed up in a phrase that you can memorize, a phrase that you can write down in some book pages somewhere or something. Um, and from that backup, you can recover all of your Bitcoin. So um, although it's very strong personal responsibility, you can um, take care of yourself pretty simply um, just by keeping track of those words, um, however you want to do it. Um, and those wallets, especially phone wallets, um, will allow you to um, create addresses, um, and those addresses you can share to other people using a QR code. Um, and then your wallet also gives you the op option um, to scan other people's QR codes. So that is kind of the way um, Bitcoin addresses get passed around, is through these QR codes um, that are passed um, maybe on a website, or maybe at the terminal, at a merchant you're buying something from, or, um, or whatever, just your friend's phone. I know on the Jack's wallet has a it's an HHD wallet. Yes. Yeah. Do are most of the uh, new wallets coming out? Are they having that? Yeah. If they have a seed, they are an HD wallet. Right. If it, a seed that, that phrase of words that recovers the whole wallet. Oh. Yeah, that's the the definition of HD is that that seed recovering a whole list of addresses. Um, yeah, and I think most wallets today are HD wallets. They they have this phrase that you can. Um, Remember, I write down somewhere to recover everything. But I mean, like every address is different. Like yeah. Price. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is there a transaction fee when I use my wallet? Yes. So um, the miners are creating these Bitcoin blocks, and they're also collecting transactions to include in the block. And your transaction doesn't um, count or isn't a valid thing until it's in a block. And there's competition between all of the transactions that have just been broadcast about who's going to be in the next block. So the higher fee you put on the transaction, the more likely it is that a miner will um, pick up your transaction in a quick period of time. Um, Um, the fee has varied a lot, and this year it's actually um, spiked up quite a bit. There was a period of time where a Bitcoin transaction was um, requiring a dollar or two dollars in order to go through in a timely period. Um, it's kind of backed off since that, um, and it's right now I think just a few cents again. But um, there, there will kind of be this fee on Bitcoin transactions on the mainnet um, for this foreseeable future, and the fees will likely increase because there's this scarce amount of block space and there's more and more people who are looking to use Bitcoin. Um, so there are other scaling solutions that try and get around that that uh, we'll get to in a minute. Um, maybe I can talk about that right now. Any other questions? Okay, um, so scaling and the future. So the blockchain um, is not really a scalable thing. It requires everyone around the world to validate everything um, and to pass all these transactions around. Um, and that is just not something that scales well. You could maybe double, maybe triple, maybe 100 times how many transactions are happening on the blockchain, but that wouldn't make a real dent in how many transactions that actually happen in the world. Um, so there's been a lot of thought put into um, how can we scale up the number of transactions that are backed by Bitcoin scarcity, backed by the trust of Bitcoin, but um, 
don't require paying these fees. Um, and it just has now become possible for a system called the Lightning Network to start going um, into production. Um, there was a lot of controversy about um, some upgrades coming into Bitcoin, and this year has just been very noisy, but it's just, it, it's come in um, a thing called Segregated Witness, and it allows um, payment channels to operate in a very efficient way. And I'm kind of going beyond um, intro to Bitcoin, but you guys want to hear about this? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, want to, we want to know the future. <laughs> um, so this, this system is going to be quite a bit different than how Bitcoin works now, but it's also going to operate in a way that's much more, um, or much quicker and much more scalable. Um, so rather than having a Bitcoin wallet like you do now, where you're managing the private keys and you're making transactions that um, broadcast to the Bitcoin network, um, require to be picked up by a miner, and um, yeah, require to be validated by everybody, um, the new version or the new wave of Bitcoin wallets are going to be managing payment channels. So rather than keeping your Bitcoin just um, locked up in your own account, you're going to keep it kind of in this shared checking account with um, someone uh, out on the Lightning Network. Um, but you're going to do it in a way that if you ever want to leave and walk away with your Bitcoin, you always have the right to do that and the ability to do that. So it is not a trusted system that you're buying into. It's a system that, um, yeah, that you can walk away from at any point with the balance that you currently have. So if you maintain a couple of payment channels with people, you can pay anybody else who's connected in payment channels, anybody else who's operating these payment channels, um, that you can find a route to through this path of payment channels. Um, should I go into the details? A little bit? Yeah. That's, okay. that's different than Bitcoin Cash. Uh, yes, it's different than Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash is kind of the other side of the scaling argument, meaning uh, we should just scale Bitcoin by increasing the block size and having more transactions that are validated by the entire network. Um, and it's kind of funny now because on the Bitcoin Cash network, there are now not enough transactions, like there's not even one megabyte worth of transactions being created every 10 minutes on Bitcoin Cash, so no one's really using that thing. Um, I think they'll die out. <laughs> I've been saying the altcoins are going to die out for a long time. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they'll last forever. <laughs> Isn't Bitcoin Cash more towards the what Satoshi had in mind, like the, that's what Roger Beer said. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, and Satoshi was a very smart guy, but there's a lot of things that have been learned along the way by a lot of smart people in seeing this thing actually work and be deployed. That just to say, uh, because Satoshi thought that we could scale in this way um, easily uh, isn't an argument that has any weight, really. It's just an argument by authority, which doesn't mean anything. Just if you're super near to Bitcoin, that's like invoking, yeah, that's yeah, invoking yeah. deity uh, good book level. <laughs> Isn't this what Jesus would want? <laughs> so this is, some, this is a very dramatic topic, the scaling issue. And essentially, um, like, like, uh, like uh, Bitcoin, I mean, it was more dramatic before August, obviously, but Bitcoin faced the problem that it was too good at what it did. And so the community had to pivot and see, okay, well, how do we patch the problems for this? So people get real passionate about it. You should definitely read all the perspectives. So the, the, the real technical people that know about Bitcoin, do you, do you think that like, they believe that Satoshi knew what was the whole to the year 2140 was going to look like? Like he, he saw into the future, and what, right? So how could you say? Like no, I'm saying, no, no, that's I know, what I'm, I'm not saying, saying is the specific phrasing of what you said is precisely the yeah. ideology of it, which is, is this what Satoshi would have wanted? That is yeah. the <laughs> way people discuss this, and it's an incredibly <laughs> religious <laughs> parallel. Yeah. Rather than Satoshi was a technologist, so likely would have liked for innovation testing yeah. and all of that to prove whatever it was. Yeah, yeah I, I think Satoshi... Yeah, religious about it. It's uh, creepy. Think. I do think the primary concerns of Satoshi was the decentralization of the network and the censorship resistance of the network. 
And I think the core devs right now are, take that as a priority. And as, when you're scaling the block size, um, you're incrementally affecting the decentralization of the system. You're making it harder for nodes to validate everything. You're making it harder for um, small miners to participate in the network. So you're kind of pushing this force against the decentralization of Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin becomes to the point where it's, it's not really decentralized, that state actors can, in a very meaningful way, lean on the powerful actors in Bitcoin to get what they want, then we've really lost something. Um, so I think the conservative nature of Bitcoin Core and their um, insistence on trying to keep everything backwards compatible so there's no hard forks, like you can't prevent people from hard forking themselves, they can always do that. Um, but I think the priorities of the core developers certainly align with my view of what Bitcoin should be. And, um, Whatever to make it mainstream, right? I think that's what everyone, doesn't everyone, everyone want that? Like, well, no, that's the problem run. though, is if you make it mainstream, in uh, within using a structure of protocol that can be hacked, so to speak, by 51% attack, that can be like, like purists are trying to keep conservative because, and I, I don't get super into this, but most of the technical devs I know are core loyalists, so to speak, rather than being behind on limited or cash or anything like that. Um, and it's because once once you make the technology. Hackable once you make, even if it's social engineering that can hack it or human systems, you can't go back from that. So we'd rather have. I mean, we have no choice at this point, as 2017 has shown, in slowing Bitcoin down. But ideally, for you know best outcomes, innovation-wise, you would want to test. I mean, that's why the DAO hack went explodey. Is because like if you if your ex first experiments are too massive. They will not fail sustainably, and big banking systems have shown us that. So it's like, a, so I think most people I know who are working on a technical level are pretty conservative about whoa, 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 let's test stuff more yeah. <laughs> before we just get it out. That's there. what I hear that the the worst thing to Bitcoin is if it gets too popular too fast, right? You want to kind of slow a slow gradient towards where you want to go. Not yeah, popular. yeah. There's still a lot of technical problems to solve, and a lot of people working on it. But yeah, just the the amount of noise and the amount of social pressure, like I think, is making people not want to work on it because it's just so uh, poisonous the environment. Um, but yeah, it's still going. There's a lot of people doing a lot of good work, and I'm very excited about the future. Um, I am going to do an intro to Lightning Network again, so kind of just touch on that a little bit right now, but um, I think Bitcoin is going to scale in a very nice way using that system, and explaining it takes longer than I have right now, so I think I'll just leave it to the intro and keep an eye on our meetup for that. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Um, yeah, if you'd like to get on our Slack um, and our calendar, you can leave your email on the whiteboard. Um, and yeah, we have a Slack channel that has um, like 600 people or something like that, just kind of <laughs> drawing on cryptocurrency um, and all of this madness you, that's going on. If you want to know about this really weird little space, I'm going to be giving a tour uh, in 15 minutes with a, or maybe even 10 for the megaphone. I want to rock a beer and then give a, because this place has been around for more than three years. It's pretty dope. Uh, we, we're certainly fans of it. It's kind of biased. Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll be like a five-ten minute tour. It will not be like Gilligan's Island. It will be a five-ten minute tour. Yeah, feel free to hang out. Nobody's being ushered out right now. Uh, ask some questions. Turn on some music. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. Boom. Oh.